I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And you know, last week we had just an incredible, uh, incredible time in the presence of God, the power of God as we celebrated Pentecost Sunday. How many of you were here for Pentecost Sunday? Come on. And, uh, and, I, and they had some trouble with the media where, you know, the service got interrupted for like 12 minutes of the message and came back on. And so they had to redo the broadcast and it comes back on with just like the body's hitting the floor. Hallelujah. You know, and, and so, like the first comment is like, no social, no social distancing here. Very concerning. And I was like, yeah, but the power of God is here. That's to be celebrated. Amen. You know, and, and um, you know, I want to tell you, listen, um, don't ever allow someone else's fear to overshadow your faith. Amen. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand for that. Come on now. And as I was praying for today, you know, and, and really right after our service on Sunday, things begin to happen in our city. And I'm sure many of you are aware of those things. But I want to tell you, that's not a surprise to the Lord. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us because we've actually been talking about it for a few weeks. A few weeks ago, we talked about when Paul was shipwrecked on Malta. And we talked about how the very first thing that they did was they started a fire and out of the fire came a snake. And so whenever there's outpouring, there's always opposition. And oftentimes the opposition will try to bite you to get you to take on the spirit of what has come against you. And so outpouring is often met with opposition, but if we respond, notice I didn't say react, but if we respond in the spirit of Christ in the midst of crisis, what looks like opposition can in fact become an opportunity and an open door for the gospel of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul did not take on what had come against him. And there are many people that rightfully so have, could, could, could justify criticism, judgment, becoming bitter, all of these things because we have questions. And what happens is when you have a question that you answer, you can find yourself uh, leaning on your own understanding and resisting the tree of life. But how many you know the Holy Spirit hasn't answered every question? Amen? And so Pete, Paul, we know that he, he shook off the snake. Say, shake it off. He got bit by a venomous snake and he shook it off. And the first thing that people around him said is, oh man, he must be a murderer because the judgment of God just came on him. And so the first thing they did was criticize him and accuse him of something he had not done. And he shook it off and they're like, oh my gosh, he must be a God, hallelujah. And see, that's why you can never allow people around you to define your story because people change their mind all the time. And oftentimes the very people you're called to reach may begin their relationship with you from a critical place, an accusatory posture. But Paul did not let what they said about him keep him from what God said about them. So he shakes off the snake. And we know that not long after that, he gets invited to dinner at this guy Publius's house. Now, Publius means popular. So, you know, evidently he was the, he was the guy growing up, Publius. There were some fun names in the Bible, weren't there? And Publius's dad was sick. Now, remember, Luke was the one who wrote Acts. And so Luke was actually on this ministry trip with Paul. And Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. And, and so here, Publius, his father is sick with, with fever and diarrhea. Hallelujah. We're in the South. We can say anything in church. In the North, they call it dysentery. But here, we'll just say, he, he was, man, he, he had hot flashes in the runs. Hallelujah. And you've all, we've all been in that place where like, Lord, just take me. Hallelujah. And so you would have thought that Paul would have said, hey, Luke, since you're a doctor, why don't you go check on him? But Paul recognized that he wouldn't have been hurt if God didn't have a healing in store for somebody else. And so we got to recognize what ways have we been bit? What ways have we been hurt? Because the area that we've been hurt that we can overcome, not in our strength, but by his strength, we can bring healing to those around us. And it doesn't cause people to look at us, it causes people to look at God. And so we know that not only did Publius' father get healed, but it says that the whole island came to hear and to be healed. And so the whole island, think about it like this, the whole city. So something happens to you that is not fair. People begin to talk about you once it happens. 
You hear them talking about it. You see it on your news feed on social media. And you have two choices. You can begin to justify yourself in your mind and have conversations with people that are not in the room. Some of you call that intercession. <laughs> or you could recognize this wouldn't have happened to me if God didn't have something he wanted to happen through me. And I want to tell you, Birmingham's history has been one as a catalyst in civil rights that we recognize that the enemy has tried to wreak much havoc and bring much harm through the gate of our city in times past. But I want to tell you that whenever you want to identify the redemptive call and purpose of a person, place, or thing, you simply look at what the enemy brought against it. You turn it 180 degrees and multiply it by seven. Because it says in Proverbs 6 that if a thief is caught in the act, he has to pay back sevenfold. And so when I begin to recognize what the enemy has tried to do to Birmingham and through Birmingham and recognize that Birmingham, the world is watching, I recognize that our call is to unite where the enemy has tried to divide. Our call is to love where the enemy has brought fear. Is anybody with me this morning? Are you, I mean, are you guys full from communion or I mean, what's going on here? We use the grape juice, right? Nobody's ready for a nap, hallelujah. I know them prepackaged are on the verge of turning, but hallelujah. We've got a short shelf life, amen? Pastor Jody says, uh, he says, man, he goes, those, those things expire quick. They got a short shelf life. I said, well, I tend to just buy them in bulk when they're getting ready to expire. I'm balling on a budget, hallelujah. Some of you, that might help you enjoy the service more. I don't know. But I want to tell you, listen, we are a people that have been born for such a time as this. And even as we spoke last, last week about 5780 on the Hebrew calendar and 2020 on our calendar, this is the year of the open mouth. This is the year of the extended hand. This is the year that we're supposed to stretch out our hand, that signs and wonders would be done by believers. This is, you know, even as I was talking to this other pastor on the phone this morning, he said, I believe that we're supposed to lay hands on the sick and they will recover and signs and wonders will follow us. And so this has been a hard season. And, and so I began to start sharing my heart. He's like, oh, yes, can you share that today? And I was like, yes, hallelujah. Do I have to wear a mask when I do it? Come on, because that just goes against my faith. Hallelujah. He said, no, you don't have to. All right. But I want to tell you, listen, signs and wonders will follow those who believe. They don't follow those who don't believe. And the Holy Spirit has been held captive by unbelieving believers for way too long. Are you with me? It's time to recognize that there are places we have been bit, but we choose not to become bitter. There are places that we recognize that racism is real, but we are not going to let it become our reality. That we are going to live till our last breath to see a different tomorrow than today. Are you with me? And that means having hard conversations. For some of us, it may mean listening more than we're talking. But it also means that we do not make an inch of room for the devil to bring lawlessness into our city, state, or nation. Because when people begin to try to take someone's pain and make it a parade, I get pissed. It's a lot of alliteration. And what we're seeing in our nation is we're seeing that darkness has been looking for an inch that they could take a mile. And when despair got in and there was a void and there was a vacuum of voices, the enemy sent ulterior voices in with ulterior motives to try to bring destruction in our day. And it stops now. Stops now. In Matthew 24, it talks about the signs of the end times. And a lot of people would talk about wars and rumors of wars, plagues and pestilence. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 says that in the, in the last days, that, that there would be false voices among us. And, and, and there would be false voices that begin to rise up, false narratives, manipulation, that would cause the love of many to grow cold. And I want to tell you what the enemy is attempting to do in this hour is to get our love to grow cold because if our love grows cold, the world will not know that we are his and they will not really believe that the father sent him for them. Are you with me? Just a few verses later, he says that the end can't come until the gospel is preached. And so when it comes to Matthew 24 and the interpretation of last days, I live between those two places. Keep your love hot and preach the gospel. Keep your love hot and preach the gospel. Don't give ear to false voices. Well, how do I know if it's a false voice? By what it brings up in you. 
So let me tell you this. The father of lies and the father of lights tend to speak at a similar time. Okay? But the father of lights, Jesus said that his words are spirit and life. So when he speaks, you're not going to have a fear of death. You won't have a fear of loss. Jesus' words will never bring you into worry, but it will always usher you into worship. When the father of lies speaks, it causes you to begin to worry about losing what you have. Because he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And so when, you, when you're having thoughts that come, when you're having conversations, oftentimes the enemy can even take a scripture and twist it out of context. He can come as an angel of light and he can begin to touch something you know to bring you into something you're not called to experience. How many of you have seen this happen? And so we have to recognize who is speaking and whose frequency are we tuned to? And if we recognize I've been giving more ear to the voice of the enemy, to the father of lies, to bring me into worry instead of the father of light that brings me into worship, we recognize that today we can give up our worry and take on his worship. That means, see, worry will always put your eyes on you. Worship will always put your eyes on him. And if we see him rightly, we'll begin to look to minister to them. Are you with me? Because when our eyes are on him, we have no fear of this, the loss of this life. Um, even as I was praying and, and just, you know, for this week, I was thinking about Azusa Street. You guys remember Azusa Street? Of course, Azusa Street was, was one of the ripple effects of, of the Welsh Revival in 1904. And the Azusa Street Revival broke out around 1906. But there was some backstory to it. And, and, and the backstory was this. Was it, was a, it was a time of incredible racism, segregation, and hatred. But God had a, a one-eyed African-American man. He was blind in his left eye. And he named him Will He See More. God always has a sign that makes you wonder. And, and Willie, Willie could have, you know, he, he could have been, he could have very easily been become bitter because of the places he'd been bit. In fact, you know, he, he desired to, to walk in ministry. He desired to preach the gospel and he wasn't trying to do it as a vocation. He was trying to do it because there was something pulling on him that was greater than anything he knew. Because he actually was waiting tables and he was, he was serving in different capacities. But there was this Bible college in town with, uh, that was run by this guy, Charles Parham. And see, uh, Charles Parham, he recognized that race was, racism was wrong, but he also felt like he couldn't do anything about it. And so he said, listen, you can't come in the class, but I'll keep the door open and you can sit outside and, you can, and I'll, maybe I'll just raise my voice a little bit. And, and you know what? To him at that time, I think it was the best he thought he could do. I'm going, man, this is my class. I'll do what I want. Hallelujah. Come on in. Shiki Baba. Forget opening the door. Let's knock down the walls. Amen. And right now we are in a season, just like Aaron sang earlier, to see Jericho's walls come down and to see everyone come back to the Father's house. Amen. Because there is no shame. There is no guilt. There is no pain of the past when you're in his presence. And so William Seymour began to hear this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And something just whew, came alive in him. He had heard the gospel. He had heard teaching. But when he began to start hearing about how God gave his very spirit to not just anoint us, but so we could look just like Jesus in the earth. That Jesus said that when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we will receive power, miracle working ability to be a witness to Jesus. He said, man, I want that. And something began to jump up and down on the inside of him. How many of you have ever, you've heard something in God and all of a sudden something in you just, just jumps up? You know what I'm talking about? That's what happened with John the Baptist pregnant in Elizabeth's womb. Mary walks in pregnant with Jesus, which is a, it's a whole nother just incredible lesson. Mary says, you know, she gets this word from Gabriel that she's going to give birth to the son of God. And she's like, how do I know this is true? He's like, well, go see your cousin who was barren, who was with child. And see, one of the things is when God, when God invites you into an impossible place, he'll always partner, partner you with somebody who is a little bit further in the, in, the, in the journey of impossibilities than you are. And see, Elizabeth was barren. You guys remember? Gabriel, the same angel, came to Zechariah in the temple and said, you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have a son and his name is gonna be John. And Zechariah said, how can this be? We're old. And he said, shut up in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Heaven put a gag order on him. And I think there's a lot of things that heaven has to say that we're arguing, we're asking questions that are, that are, that are really uh, are built more on our ability than on God's ability. 
And see, because Zacharias says, how can this be because I'm old? And he said, I'm not going to allow you to abort what God wants to birth. How many things is God wanting to birth that we've aborted because we thought it was going to take us to make it happen? Mary says, how can this be because I've not yet known a man? So she didn't say it wasn't because she was old enough or young or too young. She just said, I lack the experience. And God always has the experience that you lack to bring you into a place of birthing. And so she said, well, how do I know? She said, she could go to your cousin. Walks into Elizabeth's house, and, and all of a sudden, as she walks in, John the Baptist starts jumping around in his mama's belly. He's not just kicking, he's having a party. I mean, he, he's, I mean he's, he's getting up, he's getting down, he's jumping all around. And it says that in that moment, John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit. Because what he called to just came into his life. It came in proximity with his person. And when he found himself in the presence of the one, when he found himself near the very message he was called to carry, something on the inside began to leap. And I think because that we can, we're in such a pregnant atmosphere spiritually, we have these John the Baptist moments so often where God will begin to speak something to us. It'll grab a hold of us on the inside. And the enemy tries to distract us a minute later to forget the way that God touched us when we recognized our call just came into the house house because when you feel that anointing when you feel that witness God is saying I've brought into your life the very thing that you're called to do and if you'll begin to lay down your life you'll find it are you with me and I'm speaking to a room full of John the Baptist we exist to prepare the way for the king that's why we're king's way it's what we do not just who we are but here we see you know William Seymour he had this thing jumping on the inside of him and he couldn't be told no. And he had to deal with discrimination, disappointment, men lying to him, men taking advantage of him. And he, 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 moved, he moved from one place to the other, thinking that this could be the opportunity. This could be, and he was, continued pro, he was continually promised things from men that they would not follow through on. How many know it would have been real easy for him to become offended? And if he would have become offended, the well of God he was called to release would have never been opened up. Because offense shuts you down, not others. Offense keeps you from releasing what you have, but it also keeps you from receiving what others have to give. And then he, he's invited uh, to, to, to California. He's invited to Los Angeles. And he's invited to do a series of meetings. The only problem is that they didn't realize he was a black man. They didn't have, like, you couldn't go on Facebook and check out his profile picture. Hallelujah. <laughs> William, that sounds like a good white name. Hallelujah. <laughs> William Seymour. Hallelujah. That sounds white. Hallelujah. So he goes, and there's a lock on the church door. And nobody tells him, but there is a faithful intercessor. Because God doesn't need many, he just needs one. She had a feeling that they would do this. And she wasn't gonna let him stand at a closed door by himself. She said, I know they won't let you preach in the church, but I'll let you preach in my house. She said, I got this little house on Bray Street. It's not much, but it's yours. A little white house. And so he went and he began to share about this experience in God that was available to, available to all who would believe. This, this experience that Peter... Peter described like this, to repent, to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this promises to you, your children, and all who are far off that God will call. And as he began to talk about it, the people he spoke to, faith come, came alive in their hearts because faith was alive in his spirit. And they began to start receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in tongues. They began to start having wonderful encounters and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And guess who did not get it? Willie, but he still saw it. And the more that he saw others get what he, get what he believed for in his own life, the more determined he came, became to preach it, not only until he had it, but until the world could enter into it. And it didn't take long for them to out, out, outgrow that little, that little house. And it said very shortly after he, he started doing meetings there, they had to open up the windows and people began to gather on the, on the lawn. And I, I think it had something to do with the fact that he was willing to sit outside to see a change on the inside. That now God was beginning to draw people who were willing to sit on the outside because they desired what was on the inside. Listen, if, if we had eyes to see, we could recognize that man can really not hurt us. The devil has no power to hurt you. 
the, on, the only ability, the only power and the authority the devil has in the earth is the power and the authority that the church, belongs to the church that she gives him. And when we become offended, it's like handing over the keys of our call. And so they found this, this horse stable, and it wasn't much. But God doesn't need much to bring more. And they put some sawdust on the floor, and they put some little, you know, like, cut beams as chairs. And, and they just got together, and they made a place for God. And, and, and they didn't really have a service structure, because whatever the Spirit of God was on, that's what they would follow. Some nights it'd be on the children giving testimonies. Other nights it'd be on just intercession and groaning. Some nights it'd be on preaching. And guess what? Throughout the entire outpouring, see, history will always celebrate you, but presence, your present will rarely honor you in the way that history will. Smith Wigglesworth was, was not, he was not a popular character when he was alive. Of course, he went around punching people. <laughs> Go to Smith meeting, you make a punch, I don't know. But oftentimes history will tell a better story of you than your present. Problem is, is few people are able to be faithful in their presence so that history has a story to tell. And so um, William Seymour began to get criticized because what happened was people began to come for this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They began to come for this Pentecost experience, this charismatic manifestation because every revelation without an activation will never become a manifestation. And they recognized that God was saying something, he was doing something, and if they didn't act on it, they wouldn't have it. You see, when God speaks, it's not a guarantee, it's an invitation. And so he gives a revelation that requires an activation to become a manifestation. And so William Seymour started getting criticized because you had different people wanting him to, to make what he was doing a part of what they were doing because what they were doing wasn't working. And so maybe if he brought what he was doing into what they were doing, that would help them. But then they became critical of how he did what he did because he would not stand up as a polished preacher. He would put his head in a chicken crate. He put his head in a crate and he would pray until he felt the anointing. He would, he would get behind a pulpit and he would get down like this in a time of racial injustice, in a time of hatred, in a time of segregation. And, and he's surrounded by people that all want what he has to give and he won't open his mouth until he hears God speak. How many times are we opening our mouth and God isn't talking? What if before we, what if before we gave our two cents, we got the sense of the Lord. He wanted, he wanted to only say what he heard the Father say and do what he saw the Father do. And that was fascination. That was wonder. It brought favor because it was the fear of the Lord. In the book of Acts. It said that they praised God, and because of that, they had favor. I want to tell you, listen, one of the words that God spoke to us so clearly at the beginning of this year is that this was a year of favor. And I remember in the midst of uh, quarantine, I was at my house praying one time, and I just said, God, I know that you, you spoke so clearly to, this, to us about this word about favor, and you continue to confirm it. He said, this is what I favored you for. What good is favor if everybody's flourishing? It's because favor is not about what you have. It's an anointing to steward what you've got. Favor is not about finances. Favor is about opening doors. See, we talk about favor. How are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Next thing you know, it's like, can I have $5? <laughs> favor is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it can only come through relationship. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor, proclaim liberty to the captive, recover of sight to the blind. But then he goes on and, and later on in Isaiah 61, and he says, and To proclaim this 2020 as the year of God's favor. And see, I tell you right now, this is the year of God's favor. I've heard so many people go, Man, can we just like get a restart on 2020? Like 2020, just ever since Kobe died, just everything going, going to heck. Hallelujah. Should have known when the mamba passed. He was, listen, he was holding it all together. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you, this is the year of favor. 
And favor always shines the brightest in the darkest of times. Isaiah 60, arise and shine, arise and shine for the light of the Lord to be seen upon you, his glory be upon you. When, when, when deep darkness is on the earth and confusion and craziness is upon the people. Never has there been more darkness, more confusion and more craziness. And I think God is asking us black, white, red, yellow. Will you see more? Will you see more for your day? Will you see more for tomorrow? Or were you just going to accept what is? Guys, we're here to change this thing. You've been anointed for such a time as this. So as we look at restoring the fascination, faith, and favor of God to the church, the word restore in the Greek actually comes from a word in the Greek that means reconstitute. And it means to build up again from parts. What Jeff saw, the pieces, to build up again from parts. And, and, and this time is a time to rediscover who we are, to rediscover with awe and wonder the image of God that we're called to carry. Because I believe that as God restores honor and awe and wonder in our hearts, we're going to be, begin to see signs and wonders flow through our hands. It also means to restore something dried, especially food, to its original state by adding water to it. Isaiah 44, 3 says, So pour water on him who is thirsty, floods on dry ground, his spirit on your descendants, and his blessing on your offspring. So here in Acts chapter 3, we see a situation that actually becomes a threatening situation. It says in verse 1, it says, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. And I think that one of the things that God is inviting us to do in this season is to begin to look at every opportunity we have, every person we come in contact is a gate called beautiful. And there's people on the other side of that gate that need a touch from the Lord. And you have the touch of the Lord upon your life that they need. It says, verse two, and a certain man, excuse me, verse three, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms. He asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from him, from them. And see, this man knew what he wanted, but Peter knew what he needed. And oftentimes we can give somebody something they want and it's gonna keep them where they're at, but we can get, instead, we can begin to rise up and give them what they need and it can cause them to walk in a brand new way. So he gave them his attention, expecting, expectation. Expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. Expecting to receive something from them. Peter said in verse six, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Rise up, rise up. I don't have what you think you need, but I've got what you really want. Because you don't want to spend another day begging because it's all that you've ever known. And I think we're surrounded by a people that are simply doing what they've always known. And it is not up to us to meet them where they're at and to encourage what's been. It's up to us to say, you don't have to lay here hurting anymore. You don't have to lay here begging at the gate. You don't have to lay here looking for something to be given to you. Because Peter had something greater and it was the kingdom of God. It was an invitation to true freedom. And to those who are bound and afraid, freedom can be a fearful thing. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So where is the spirit? Where the spirit of the Lord is or where the Lord is spirit, Paul said there is liberty and there is freedom. So my question is, where is the spirit? Where is he today? Paul said in Ephesians 4, to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. And in, 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 in a social justice issues and, and in areas of injustice, we can be so quick to, to give our agreement and an overreaction to the truth. We allow an instance to, to rob us of our integrity instead of saying, where is the spirit of God in this? 
Where is the Spirit of God? Because the Spirit of God does not deny what is, but he begins to illuminate our hearts to what could be if we would stand in the gap with those who are hurting and recognize that in Jesus Christ, they have an invitation to be made whole. Amen? Now, here's what's beautiful about Peter. Peter didn't just pray a prayer and walk away. He didn't, he, he didn't just say, I'm gonna pray for you. Which, by the way, if someone ever asks you for prayer or you say you're gonna pray or somebody texts you or says, hey, they share with you a need, how many of us are quick to do the praying emoji hand back? I'll pray. I would encourage you that when you say that, do it. Because the anointing is on obedience. Amen? I remember one time somebody asked me, you know, they, 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 were somebody, they didn't go to church here. There was somebody from across the world, sent me an issue. And, and uh, they were telling me about a situation. And uh, they said, will you pray? I said, I will pray. And so I got offline and I, was, I wasn't praying. I was actually going back to doing what I needed for you to get here. And the Lord said, will you? If you'll pray, I'll answer. But I can't answer a prayer you don't pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And part of humility is recognizing that none of us see the whole picture. But together, we can see it a lot more clearly. He said, if his people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray, he will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Friends, I stand before you to say the church has sins that need to be forgiven. This church right here, I bet there's some sins that are related to our current day that need to be heard and be forgiven so God can heal our land. When we hear an invitation like that, let's not apply it to someone else before we first apply it to us. You ever been in a message where you're like, man, someone so needs to hear this. Yeah, but you're the one there. So I bet God really thought you needed to hear it too. That's humility. And real strength is in humility. Micah 6, 8 says, what does God require but to love mercy, to walk humbly with God and to do justice? But if you don't love mercy and you don't walk in humility, you can't do justice. And there's a call right now for justice in the earth. But I want to tell you, justice without righteousness is revenge. The foundations of his throne are justice and righteousness. And justice without righteousness is a throne that's going to topple every time. And what happens is, as believers, we can misuse our authority when we seek justice without righteousness. Does that make sense? And righteousness is revelation. It's identity. He took him by the right hand. I love this. And I believe this is the invitation that we have, even today with this prayer walk. So yes, he prayed. Yes, he pointed the man to Jesus. But then he took him by the right hand. Peter took his hand and he stretched it out to this man and he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. I wonder if the man could have got healed with just a prayer or if he needed somebody to lift him up while praying as well. To pray, but also be practical. To lift up the Lord, but also lift him up. I believe that without Peter stretching out his hand, it would have been a prayer that was prayed that may not have been answered that day. But Peter didn't just pray for him. He said, I'm gonna be a part of seeing this prayer answered. And he took action. A lot of us have been praying because we haven't known what to do. But I encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit, show me how to pray, but also show me what I can do. And, 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 and it was inconvenient for, for Peter to do that because it said it was the hour of prayer and they were on the way to the temple, so they were already late. So are you like me? Do you try to fit in more things before you have to be somewhere than you have time to do it? And so it said it was the hour of prayer and they were still on the way to the temple. So they were supposed to have already been there. Did y'all catch that? Peter was late to church and he was speaking. And so here at an inconvenient moment, He's willing to allow everything else in his life to stop because of the one that Jesus loves. I think that's what it looks like to leave the 99 and go after the one. And I think that's what each and every one of us can do because life will run you ragged 
but his life will reveal his righteousness. So he leaping up, woo, come on, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. So he was no longer down here and Peter was up there. There was no longer a societal separation. There was no longer less than and more than because somebody reached out. And wasn't it Peter that the Holy Spirit used to preach the gospel to Cornelius' house and the Holy Ghost, got pulled up, put, the Holy Ghost got pulled out and started a race riot in the apostles' meeting? Remember that? Peter goes to Cornelius' house. He's not even trying to have a miracle service. He's just talking about how Jesus came preaching the gospel of peace and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost gets poured out. He goes, well, look at that. I truly perceive that God has no respect our persons. And then Peter, they, the, the other apostles back in Jerusalem that believe the Holy Spirit is just for, for Jews, they hear that the Gentiles done got the Holy Ghost and now Peter is the problem. And Peter's like, it was the Lord. Like he interrupted my message. I, was, I wasn't done yet. I hadn't even given an altar call and then just God showed up. I don't know. But even in the early church, they had an issue of racial bias. And I want to tell you, I believe that race is something that I've wondered if this is something that we can ever truly be healed of. I know it's a wound in our nation, but I know that there's some things that are, that are not, it's not something that is displaced. It's something you wrestle with. Paul said in Ephesians 6, and I'm, I'm, I'm walking this through the Lord and asking the Lord, what, what does it look like to overcome in this area? What does it look like to wrestle in this area? And he talked about spiritual hosts in heavenly places. He talked about principalities that we wrestle with. And so there's devils you cast out, but there's also principalities you wrestle with. And see, principalities work through personalities. And so I believe that racism is a principality over this nation, but we're called to wrestle with it and not surrender. We can't submit. We cannot take, we can't take a knee. We, can't, we cannot allow this thing to pin us. We have to continue to push back. We have to continue to reveal who the Lord is. We have to continue to reach out, lift up, and love well while also speaking truth. Loving well is not co-signing deception. So if someone has a wrong belief that is producing wrong behavior, loving them well is to step in and say, this isn't who you are, and I love you. I love you, and I, I am committed to you, and I'm committed to who you're called to be, and this right here doesn't look like you to me. So can we talk about this? I was on a, I did an interview this past week with the church in Canada, some friends up there, and they were asking about, you know, questions about, you know, what did we learn in this season and racism and riots and stuff like that? They said, you know, it kind of hits America before it hits us. And, and so, and I said, you know, I said, honestly, I said, there's, there's a lot of pain right now that people are holding in their hand, but I believe that if we can have the hands come together and we say, look, this is, this is where I am, but I don't want to remain where I am. That together we can bring these things to the Lord and we can talk about it so we can move forward. Because the glory of something restored is greater than the former. How many of you know that? And if the enemy meant to bring harm, how many know God is going to bring us good? This is actually a divine opportunity to see all of these scriptural promises come to pass if we can respond rightly and, and not allow our emotions to get into a swirl. When I was talking to this pastor today about the prayer walk, he, he said, listen, he said, he said, my prayer for today is that we can separate ourselves from all of the emotion that is happening and get back to what is God saying. Because I want to tell you, listen, God is a God of emotions. But a lot of the emotions that are happening right now are not born from heaven. Are you with me? And so we have to be honest about that. We, cannot, we have to be transparent. We cannot be fearful of being rejected if I'm honest about how I feel. And that's what family is. Like if we're really family, we need to know. I was talking with just one of our incredible anointed young leaders here. And, and, and he was sharing with me his, his story and just how he's had a fear of missing it or a fear of failure or a fear of saying the wrong thing. And I said, I understand because you feel like if you fail, you'll get rejected or you won't have an opportunity or you'll be misplaced. or you're, He goes, yes. I said, that doesn't happen in a family. I said, I've been a part of ministries to where whoever was the most anointed got the most airtime. And I said, but if we have a fear that if I miss it, that I'm no longer gonna have a place, I will never step out. Because I'd rather be safe than to actually begin to risk it and become who I'm called to be. And this is, an, this is the time that we've gotta be willing to risk it. What if Esther, what if Esther wasn't willing to risk her place in the king's house for the kingdom that needed to come? 
And Esther 4.14 says, who knows, you know, if we keep silent this time, God will raise up somebody else for relief and deliverance in the year 2020. But I'm not leading the people who are here to stay silent. We're a people who are called to be a voice. We're called to give value. We're called like Peter to begin to lift up others so we can see them leap. We can begin to see them walk. We can begin to see them jump and begin to praise God. Go ahead and stand your feet. We'll come back to this when we have some more time, but... We can't expect people to get up if we don't help them up. He leaped, then he began to walk, then he began to jump, and then he began to praise. And that's actually the process of transformation. First, we're delivered from the pit. Next, we begin to walk out this thing called faith. Paul said that if we've received Christ, so walk in him. Next, we begin to celebrate, we begin to enter into our own relationship. So we begin to disciple others in the place we've been discipled. Now, not long after this, of course, there was a big stir, because there always is. And people began to get all restless, talking about how the lame man had been healed. And Peter's like, why are you looking at us? As though by our own righteousness, we, we healed this man. They said, well, you said, look at us. He said, no, 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 this is faith in the name of Jesus. We were just the messenger. We weren't the miracle. But right after that, they had some threats come against them. And I wanna tell you, in times of revival, the political and the religious spirit will both try to rise up. And what we have right now is we have political spirits, we have religious spirits beginning to rise up in our nation that are beginning to threaten the voices in the church. And it's interesting to me that when Peter felt threatened in the garden with Jesus, pre-Pentecost, pre-Holy Ghost, he took matters into his own hands. He took out that sword, he cut off that ear and made that post on Facebook, hallelujah. And it felt better to his flesh, but it grieved the Lord. But now post-Pentecost, after he's been restored, because Peter, Peter knew what it was like to do well and then to have a bad day. Anybody ever had a bad day? To feel like you're gonna get thrown out, but for Jesus to show, still show up. And he was restored and, Peter, and Jesus said this, he said, when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. And when Jesus restored Peter back into relationship and then responsibility, it has to be relationship before responsibility. He restored him into relationship and then responsibility. Now he is facing the same threats that came in the garden. The very same people that arrested Jesus are now coming for Peter and John. And he didn't say, I'm gonna cut you. He said, Lord, look upon their threats and stretch forth your hand to heal the signs and wonders be done in the name of your servant, Jesus. You see, because when he stretched out in his own strength and he cut off that ear, he saw the Lord stretch out his hand to heal Malchus. And whether he put the ear back on or he made a new one in his hand, it really didn't matter because a deaf ear could now hear. And I believe that this, the, the, the ear of our society has been cut off too many times by the church as we've reacted wrongly to situations that needed a revelation of righteousness. And Jesus is restoring the ability of people to hear in this season, if we will be willing to listen. So they said, Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. Signs and wonders will be done. And it says that the Lord answered and the place where they were assembled began to shake. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and boldness. And I wanna tell you, God is inviting us to enter into the fear of the Lord, to come back to that place of awe, that place of wonder, to allow our fascination with God to be restored, our fascination with the person of Jesus. And in that place, He can trust us with favor because we're in a secure place called the fear of the Lord. And in that place, we recognize our life is not our own and we may not have the gold, we may not have the silver, but we've got God. And we're willing to stretch out our hands and get them dirty where they need to be so that somebody else can learn to walk. So can we just stretch our hands to the Lord? I just believe that he wants, to, he wants to bless us so that we can bless others. Father, even as they were told in, in, in Numbers chapter six, Lord, to bless. Lord, I ask that your face would shine upon us right now in the name of Jesus and that your glory would be revealed through us. God, I ask, Lord, that there would be, be an awakening in the church that we would no longer stand by and watch from the sidelines. But bless God, we would get in the game. Bless God, 
We would not stand back and wait for something beautiful, but we get in the gate and make beautiful out of the bad situation. God, I speak to the lame conditions of our society right now. The areas that have been crippled by what has happened in times past. And I say that in Jesus, you can be healed. So Lord, right now, God, I ask that you give us vision for our city, vision for our region, vision for our nation. Lord, that we would have a genuine Christ-centered agape love, not just for those who worship with us or look like us, but Lord, all people. God, I ask for that. Lord, Lord, help us to see bias that we don't know we have. Help us to recognize blind spots that we don't even know we've got. Help us to recognize ingrained, inherited beliefs that are keeping us from seeing you as you are and seeing others the way you would have us to see them. We humble ourselves before you, God, and we ask for help. We ask that you would stretch forth your hand to first heal our hearts, heal us, and heal our nation. Heal your church. Bring a healing in the divide so that together we can be revived in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship him this morning. So the Lord bless Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing that again. The Lord bless you. around the promise. Lord, we want to see your prayer prayed more than any prayer we could pray today. Lord, that we would be one as you and the Father are one. And the whole world would know that the Father sent you and that we are yours. 
God, I thank you, Lord, there's a whosoever call being released into the city right now. God, I thank you that you're redeeming Birmingham right now. Lord, that it's no longer bombing ham. It's no longer a place of racial divide, but that you are burning ham, that, that, that sphere that tried to expose the weakness of others out of the tapestry of our city. God, I thank you, Lord, even as so many of us have been brought to this place from outside because you gave us a call and you gave us a vision to see this city set on fire by God. And so, Lord, right now what the enemy is trying to do is setting cities on fire. We just say you ain't seen anything yet because God's going to redeem. We're going to repair and we're going to see these cities set on fire for God in the name of Jesus. We're not going to be found searching for unity around a problem, allowing the problem to become our filter or our focus. But we're also not going to deny that there is a problem. But we're going to look at that problem through the unity around promise and say, this is where we've been, but together we can move into where God is inviting us to be. God, I ask that you'd remove from us the filters of fear the focus that we've had on, on what the enemy has tried to do and what others have done under his influence. God, I thank you. The very first thing that you did in John 20, when you breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Before they were called to preach a message, before they were called to pray or prayer walk, you said, forgive. You invited them to forgive. And so Lord, let forgiveness start with us. Let forgiveness start with us. Let forgiveness start with us. Let fascination be restored. Let favor be restored. Let the fear of the Lord and wonder be restored to the church in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love you. We bless you. Again, this afternoon, we're gonna be meeting over at the Art Museum across from the courthouse downtown. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that, we need everybody there by 145. So try to get there between 130 and 145. No parking could be a, a challenge. Carpool if you can. But um, let's give an hour and join our hearts with the Lord. Amen. I love you. And I'm proud of you. You're amazing. Amen. Thanks so much for taking the time to join with us for one of our online services here at Kingsway. We truly hope that you were blessed, encouraged, and empowered through this broadcast. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can stay updated with newly uploaded content. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can like, comment how this video impacted you, and share with your friends so they can be encouraged as well. No matter which platform you're using, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at testimony at kingswayal.com to let us know where you're watching from and how God used this service to speak to you. Thanks again for joining us. We love you.